And I wonder for people in their 20s if they like shouldn't go to San Francisco. The entrepreneurs are held in excessively high regard in my view and San Francisco doesn't really encourage the pursuit of really deep technical depth. I guess my general view is most products and most businesses, things can just be done much better. And I think moats are, are typically kind of overrated. The businesses that we serve, which is in rough terms, 1% of the global economy. I mean, that's about a trillion dollars a year. That then makes us like really terrified of outages. We're all trying to impress upon people at Stripe the importance of multi-decadal abstractions. I think people sometimes respond to that thinking that that's implausibly ambitious. But no, I, th I think that's actually just what happens when you get this stuff right. Okay, today I have the pleasure of speaking with Patrick Collison, CEO of Stripe. Patrick, first question. You have an excellent compilation of advice uh, on your blog for people 10 to 20. And you say there that once you turn 35, you'll write some for people in their 20s. What, do you, what advice do you have for us now, uh, the, the people in our 20s now? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when's it coming? <laughs> I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, the one I've been wondering at recently is, um, you know, I, I said for that advice for people in their uh, teens, they should yeah. go to San Francisco. Um, and I wonder for people in their 20s if they like shouldn't go to San Francisco. And I mean, glib, and you know, I think there's a significant set of people who should in fact go to San Francisco. But the, the thing that I wonder about is um, for th there is a set of career paths that I think some set of people um, you know, ought to pursue and would derive most fulfillment from pursuing uh, and, um, and that are, you know, that are really valuable for the world uh, if pursued that require accumulating a lot of expertise uh, and you know really really studying a domain in uh, in tremendous depth and I think San Francisco valorizes and look this is this is also San Francisco's great virtue San Francisco valorizes a kind of striking out on your own iconoclastically dismissing the sort of received wisdom and uh, and um, you know the 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 founding archetypes of, uh, and lore of the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and uh, all the rest. And, you know, I'm way less successful than those people, but like to some extent, you know, Stripe, in as much as it fits a pattern, is an instance of that pattern. Um, and look, that's that's great. And I'm kind of happy that that phenomenon exists in the world. But but I, I don't think that um, just the world needs lots of other things, right? Uh, and I don't think San Francisco particular. I mean, I'm, I'm again using San Francisco as a kind of metonym for a cultural orientation, sure. but uh, I think that San Francisco doesn't really encourage, yeah, the um, the the pursuit of uh, of really deep technical depth. Uh, and you know, we're here. We're recording this in South San Francisco, um, and. Um, you know, South San Francisco is most noteworthy in uh, the um, in the corporate world for, of course, being the uh, the headquarters of uh, Genentech. Uh, and you know, uh, Genentech was uh, was co-founded by uh, Bob Swanson and Herb Boyer. Um, and you know, they, they they produced cheap insulin for the first time with recombinant DNA. Um, like Herb Boyer couldn't have done that like at age twenty three. <laughs> um, Herb Boyer first had to accumulate all of the knowledge. And the skills required to, you know, be able to invent that over the course of a multi-decade career, and then I don't know what age he was when he uh, finally went went and invented it. But uh, he was not in his twenties, um, and uh, and like I, I feel San Francisco perhaps doesn't uh, doesn't culturally encourage one to become her boyer. Mm -hmm. or, or yesterday, at the time of recording this podcast, um, Patrick Sue, one of the co-founders of Arc, which. And maybe we will speak about uh, you know later in the show. This is a, a biomedical research organization we uh, we started a few years ago. Um, he announced uh, uh, these um, uh, this this new phenomenon of bridge editing, uh, which is um, uh, a new recombinase uh, where you can uh, insert DNA uh, into a into a genome. And you know it's pretty early, but it it might turn out to be you know quite consequential. Uh, and you know in order to do something like that, you have to study for a long time um, and just acquire a lot of you know, basic um, and not so basic uh, technical skills. And so anyway, the, the thing, and I don't quite know how to synthesize it yet, but as I think about advice for, for people in their 20s, look, I, I'm not going to normatively pretend or, or 
presume to um, to know kind of in like in which direction one should go in one's life. And obviously, there are successful examples of basically every strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing. At what age? 23. 23. Um, uh, so that's... I mean, a podcast uh, isn't. <laughs> I'm not inventing well, no, 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 your covenant DNA look, here. I, 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 but look, I, I think uh, um, uh, information dissemination um, is, a, is a really valuable thing in the world um, and causes... Uh, like the, the, the guy who, um, who last I heard... Um, was uh, in the in the lead for Nat's Scroll Prize. Yeah. Uh, 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 Nash told me learned about uh, the Scroll Prize. You know, listening to your podcast, right? So I, th- I think kind of cre- increasing the catalytic surface area of uh, of you know certain kinds of information is, is a valuable thing in the world. So I'm I'm very glad you know you're you're pushing the podcast. Anyway, uh, I I don't presume to know what people should do with their lives, uh, obviously, but. Um, but anyways, I, I wonder, in, in as much as they're trying to give advice, uh, and especially maybe if they're reading my advice and not someone else's advice, maybe they're kind of thinking about you know career paths that look sort of directionally like mine. Uh, I think I think my advice might be, I mean, maybe you should do something like what 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 I did or I'm trying to do. But but there are other paths as well, and I think a lot of really important invention in the world, and a lot of the things that I'm most happy. Are happening um, actually require a very different trajectory, and I think there were counter ver- counterfactual versions of my life where you know I I you know pursued that path, and well, who knows how well it would have worked. Mm. Um, uh, and and wait, let's say last point in this. And San Francisco is just very status oriented. I feel in this way. I mean, maybe status oriented is I mean, everything is status oriented, so that, that's kind of tautological. But um, it maybe maybe really what I'm saying is, I feel San Francisco. Um, the entrepreneurs are um, are held in excessively high regard, in my view. And look, I I guess I like entrepreneurs, um, uh, uh, and you know, I, th- I think um, I think uh, look, entrepreneurs as an aggregate sort of group in the world, you know, all the all the companies built in Stripe, you know, I think I think are I think are great. But uh, but there's just a, a strange version of it in San Francisco that I think is um, um, should not be should not be people's only fixation. Yeah, I mean, what I like about this and what I like about you is just like you have this sort of uh, a sense of like contrarianism of like the things people are expecting to hear from you in any given moment. You just like really want to just tell them the opposite. Um, I don't even know, like when, when uh, uh, I feel like, yeah, when EA was a little bit more popular, you were like, yeah, you know, here's the problems, here's why progress is important. And when it was down in its depths, like, hey guys, pay attention. Um, uh, but okay, on this particular piece well, of advice. Well, uh, Michael Nielsen says that, you know, every field in science uh, has... Uh, you know, way too many adherents or way too few, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like you know, the market is almost never in, in sort of the, 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 the right equilibrium. And I, I think something like that might be, I mean, I, I think the reflexive, contr- I, in a contrarian way, I'll say that I think reflexive, <laughs> reflexive contrarianism for the sake of it um, is, is also tired. And, uh, you know, if you, um, if you, uh, if you're just contrarian to the prevailing sure. mood, then, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're just following the prevailing mood, but, you know, with a, with a sign bit inversion yeah, or something. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't endorse that either, but, um, but I think that, I think the herd is a really powerful phenomenon. Actually, one of the learnings of my adult life, um, has been that it's, it's very, I mean, everyone knows and kind of says, or frequently hears that, you know, you, you should be very wary of following yeah, the prevailing tides and moods and uh, whims and everything, but you know it's freaking hard to do in practice. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, so what practically does that look like to hone your craft in any of these disciplines that take a long time? I mean, you you know you've you've spoken and tweeted about like some of the problems with modern universities. Is it still is that still the de facto path if you want to be the great biologist that Arc hires or something? Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, in, in many domains, I don't know, right? Uh, so in in like hardware, which is not a small domain, uh, most most things in the world involve stuff and things uh, and i just have no facility with or, or experience with you know doing things in hardware and so if you wanted to become like a super skilled um practitioner there you know what's the what's the best uh, uh career path i i don't know like may- maybe maybe it's to drop out and join um uh you know spacex or something um uh, i'm not i'm not necessarily endorsing uh, uh just uh um pursuing the most you know establishment and you know credential oriented path um uh, i um, I think people should try to find the gradient of maximal learning uh, in whatever it is they care most about, uh, and um, and and yet, you know, the, the question then is, you know, what that is for for for, for biology. N- look, n- not that I'm a biologist, but it is very clear that um, in order to do really good work, there are a lot of bench skills and um, and. Um, well, there are a lot of bench skills one has to acquire, and then there just is a lot of actual specific knowledge um, where you know the, the body 
well, any kind of uh, any kind of life, you know, wasn't designed with uh, you know neat fundamental principles the way that maybe physics was. Um, you know, a lot of it is obviously evolved and contingent and messy and complicated and all the rest. And so there is a lot of just specific factual stuff to learn. And I think for those two reasons, I think there there are very few um, there are very few successful pure autodidacts uh, in in biology. Um, where you, at some point, in virtually every case that I'm aware of, have to have had direct experience with, um, with, uh, you know, with, with in and with a top lab, uh, where you're seeing how people, you know, actually do it um, uh, in practice. And actually, maybe this also ties back to what we were some of what we were discussing previously, where uh, you, to your question about sort of the founders and what they, you know, learn from each other and so on. I think. Um, there's an interesting book, uh, Apprentice to Genius, uh, that follows. Or it's three or four. It's three generations of scientists. So you know, someone who mentored somebody else, uh, who in turn mentored another scientist, and uh, they were all extremely successful. Uh, and you know, the book is kind of this uh, this um, this reflection on. I mean, this. this description of what they all did, but also this kind of reflection on, well, like, what is it that was transferred? Uh, and uh, you know, for example, one thing it uh, it describes is well. One of the most important um, and subtle, you know, questions in science is problem selection. Like, just how do you choose what to work on, right? Um, no, no, no one tells you what to do, um, and and you do have to answer this question multiple times. Like with a company, in some sense, you just have to decide like once, and then you know, you, it, it's kind of well, maybe it's an iterative process from there. Whereas in science, you're you're frequently pursuing you know, completely new problems, um, and of course, you need to choose something that's you know, sufficiently important and hard that it would be important if you succeeded, but also that uh, that you know, it's not so intractable that you know you you can't actually make any progress. And so I mean, the, the the book describes how um, this is part of what uh, what the mentees describe that you know they learn from their mentors. Another thing they talk about is just learning about high standards uh, and what high standards actually are. And um, when I talk to people in other domains, uh, this is so frequently the thing that I hear from them um, uh, that. When they worked with X person or at Y organization or in Z environment or whatever, that they learned what great actually is, and that just permanently changed uh, their sense for uh, what their what their own standard for their work ought to be. Um, and so, um, and so maybe one version of the you know what people in the twenties should do is is you know. Um, Get get some ideas to domains you're interested in or care about, but then figure out where can you learn the highest standards, uh, where are the highest standards embodied, uh, and where you know where, where where can you go and experience that firsthand. Huh. Uh, before we get back to Stripe and Arc Institute and everything, I want to just touch on the Parker Study stuff for a second. Hmm. Um, so there, there's a view that says, listen, if we improve the NIH 10 percent or whatever percent, are we are we really making a dent in the fact that ideas are getting harder to find over time? And how much of um, like how much of a difference do institutions make anyways? Can it, right. it just like if it's just about a number of researchers and how many people in your society you can put into research? Yeah. It's like it's not like Singapore can have a m much more effective scientific institution that lets it compete with America in science or something like that. Do you, wh 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 what's wrong with that intuition? Noah Smith and others have talked about um, I can't remember the, the the term he used. Something like uh, moneyism. Um, uh, he had a, a funny, a, a funny phrase. Um, but but sort of this idea that we um, that we assume there is some um, kind of constant elasticity between investment in some particular outcome, like building a semiconductor factory in Arizona or a new bridge or whatever, and the outcome of you know the factory or the bridge. Uh, and one, the conversion rate between you know those. Um, uh, the, the, those inputs and the output is, uh, you know, is is not a cosmological constant. Uh, like m maybe any of these things could be done for a half or a tenth or you know whatever of the cost. Um, but two, uh, there's you know there, there are even deeper questions as to like you know <laughs> is it possible at all or uh, you know what else would have to change for it to be possible and what are the other constraints like by kind of just talking about these things in funding and dollar terms you're kind of making the implicit assumption that the only relevant constraint is is the financial one where in practice maybe it's permits or it's you know labor shortages or you know it's it's it's, uh, it's other things so anyway in the context of uh, of the NIH and science and and R and D. I'm really skeptical of um, of this kind of this this same approach being brought to bear, where you know we can uh, where we can um, 
we can just talk about the amount that we're spending on R&D and think that that's implicitly a useful measure of the uh, of the output. Uh, and you know, in, in, to a fairly close approximation, there were around one percent as many uh, practicing professional scientists uh, in the U.S. pre World War II as post World War II, um, and um, uh, or say even 1950, uh, and, and you know the other kind of epiphenomena, you know, in papers or patents and and so forth, you know, it tends to uh, you know yeah f follow pretty similar ratios, um, and. You know, we, we we got a lot of like pretty good stuff uh, in the uh, in the in the first half of the century, um, and uh, you know, despite increasing the amount that we spend by you know between two and maybe maybe I mean slightly more than two orders of magnitude, um, not quite three. Uh, it's uh, it's just it's it, it's not clear to me that there is like a direct linear relationship. And so you know, when when analyzing the NIH or how we should pursue any of this stuff. I'm inclined to try to get way more, I guess, concrete and tactile and try to think, okay, like wh what would success here look like at, well, what is happening today at the micro scale? Um, and what are the, like, what are the actual problems? And then what could success look like at the micro scale? Uh, and then what might it look like to scale that up? And just to give one kind of pointed example of that, we ran a survey of the Fast Grants grant recipients um, uh, after fast grants, uh, asking about their, their normal work and not, not about anything to do with fast grants itself. And we asked them um, if they had flexible funding, um, uh, that is to say, if they could spend their research dollars, uh, their, their current research dollars, wherever they wanted. So not if they like had more research dollars, just if they could spend, uh, um, if they could direct their current dollars however they wanted, how much their associated research program would change. Um, and we gave them three options, not much, a little, and a lot. 79% said a lot. Uh, so four out of five said that their research agenda would change a lot um, if uh, if if this constraint was removed, and so like should the NIH funding level be you know X or one point one X or one point two X or whatever? That seems to me like a bad way to analyze this question as compared to you know for example perhaps how bound and constrained should an NIH grantee be uh, in choosing their their research agenda? You know m m maybe I mean if if they're Judgment was way better uh, than uh, than that of the committees. I'm not saying it is, but maybe it is. Who knows? And um, maybe there's a five x improvement, <laughs> you know, to be generated just by making that one one switch. Uh, so um, so yeah, I'm just I'm very skeptical of these um, of these financially oriented uh, frameworks. Hmm. I mean, uh, 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 maybe the financial is not the right word for it, but just like trying to map inputs to outputs is the framing which you're using to compare the pre World uh, War II yes. um, uh, uh, inputs to. Um, what's happening now. And if it was particular to the scientific institutions, you'd expect, for example, that things that are disconnected from like the NIH specific structures. Yes. I mean, obviously the, the, you, you've talked a lot about the R is getting harder to find paper. Right. And you know, you know, they, like a uh, sector through sector, it's not like NIH is funding Moore's law progress, right? But even there you see, you need exponentially more researchers to yes. keep up the same level of progress. Um, so it, it does seem important to have these, um, level effects uh, that are one time in the case of something like COVID where like, yeah, we need that level effect right now. Um, but when, uh, if, we've, if we're framing it in terms of like hundreds of years from now, we're going to be, uh, this is going to be the thing that increases growth rates, um, which is a sort of framing that is also uh, supplied when talking about these progress of these things. Does that make sense in that context when like all these sectors are seeing these slowdowns, which seem consistent with just like, yeah, this is how uh, the uh, economy and science progresses over time? I don't know is a short answer. I think it's really puzzling. Um, uh, I think the, um, yeah, like the uh, the constancy of uh, of uh, U.S. GDP growth um, is, I think, just like one of the weirdest things. And I don't yeah. know if we've got explanation for it. Um, I, but, but but also, I, I don't think that it's or sorry, uh, an obvious thing to do would be to shrug and say, okay, well, just it's 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 overdetermined or something, and that's just like how countries work. Uh, <laughs> but you can look at other countries where yeah. you know, it's obviously manifestly not the case. And so, you know, what is it that's weird and special about the US? The, the thing that I wonder about in a lot of these cases is um, you, you could get many of the observed system phenomena and characteristics uh, if we, like, <laughs> if we weren't actually adding productive capacity. Um, like, that's, that's a simple way to explain a lot of it. And that if you're just adding um, exponentially more unproductive capacity, mm -hmm. uh, then, then on, on a stylized level, a lot of this stuff would just fall out of it. Um, now, I'm not saying that we're necessarily doing that, um, uh, uh, but it could be that, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're making them, um, well, th 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 there's lots of ways where, where, where that could be the, um, 
that could be what's effectively going on, even if it's not the case that like the the marginal people or things or organizations themselves are bad. It's just kind of somehow how the how the components interact. Um, but the the fact that you could get yeah these uh, these exponentially diminishing returns through the addition of uh, ever more non productive capacity makes me makes me um, not persuaded that the low hanging case is necessarily true, yeah. um, and give some weight to the prospect that yeah it is uh, it's fundamentally structural cultural um, or or uh, organizational um, and you know just to to give a sort of um, you know, a, a micro example there, and and it's a, it's it's a very you know, basic and um, an obvious one, but you know I, I think it's interesting to compare the you know, the, the 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 SpaceX R and D budget mm. and the NASA R and D budget, um, and and like to, to actually look at those two time series together, and you know, it, it's um, well, maybe we're just returning to the the kind of the the, the financial point again, but um, I. Um, it, it it seems pretty clear that as NASA has um, that the, the, the trajectory of NASA's efficacy uh, has uh, has not fully followed the trajectory of its inputs. Yeah, yeah. Although the the, the point about um, the marginal inputs we put into science have not been as highly effectively used or as high quality as what was before. Like the one X is a much higher quality one X than hundred X. Um, that it's not clear what you do to fix that. Like if, if it's just a case that there's like a limited amount of John Von Neumanns in your society that are like yeah. part of the pre-World War II one X it's, you know, it, it's not like we can just put a hundred X, uh, more, uh, John Von Neumann type physicist into the, into science. If the binding constraint is, yeah, the number of John Von Neumanns, then, then, then yes, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's bad news, I guess. Uh, like there's, there's not a lot we can kind of do on yeah. the margin. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, like I think the, I guess I keep going back to the, the, the cultural and the, and the sociological point, uh, mm. where, um, so Gertie and Carl Corey, uh, they, um, they ran a lab at the University of Washington, St. Louis, uh, and six of their students, if I recall correctly, uh, went on to win Nobel Prizes. Um, and, you know, they had a well-known lab and, uh, and, you know, they got, they got like good students, um, but they weren't the most prestigious lab in the world. It's not like they got to, you know, cherry pick every year, like the single most promising person. Um, and so, you know, something was going on there, <laughs> um, and, there's a book about it, and it, it tries to get into this a little bit, and I don't, know, I, I don't know that I can figure out sort of quite what it was. And they, they, there was also some good fortune where you know, they got into molecular biology at a good time. Um, but but I think there were these kind of hopeful data points where um, you know again they were obviously extremely brilliant people, but I think that the thing that distinguished them and their students was not that they were these you know seven sigma Martians. Um, uh, I think rather that they they found organizational structures that uh, and cultural practices that really worked. I think those are at least in principle more replicable. Now you might still say, okay, fine in theory, but you know how do you actually do that? Uh, and I think that's um, I think that's the big open question. Okay, I, I think that's a great uh, that's a great point to talk about Arc Institute. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you just kind of answered this question basically, but um, uh, it, it's not exactly like biology research is uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that society has neglected. So what's the theory of change here? Is it just such story similar to Stripe in that if you get the right people, uh, even though bi you know there's like tens of billions of dollars of biology funding, getting the right people and the right culture and right dedication is, is what it takes. Even though there are lots of scientists and um, and lots of lots of universities, um, there's a lot of homogeneity uh, today um, in in how science and in particular how biomedical science is pursued. Uh, where and kind of basic you know uh, research you know, in, in an academic context, you know before there's any commercialization uh, or prospect of it in sight, and um, and. I don't know that the model is necessarily a bad one. Certainly, you know, we're not particularly claiming that it's a bad one, but sort of the the construct of universities, labs, a PI, a principal investigator running the lab, that person you know, applies for grants primarily to the NIH, maybe supplemented by you know other um, other sources, uh, and uh, and grants reviewed by uh, committees with uh, with pretty. Um, uh, study sections, as they call them, with kind of pretty rigid scoring criteria and so on. Like that's the structure, um, and um, it just seems suboptimal to me. I mean, uh, homogeneity is bad in basically any ec ecosystem, especially ecosystems where you're, um, uh, you know, where you're where you're producing or excuse me, where you're seeking tail outcomes. Uh, and we thought that for a variety of reasons, uh, like. Well, from first principles that other models should be possible and that like 
we had we had specific ideas as to how you know one particular model uh, might be a might be a good idea and you know complementary to the status quo in very short terms. Um, uh, what's different about Arc is one, scientists are funded to pursue. Uh, scientists are funded themselves to pursue whatever they want. So it's it's curiosity driven research, uh, whereas NIH grants are are given for projects. Um, second, we build a lot of in-house infrastructure so that scientists can draw upon other platforms and other capabilities that they don't have to go and you know build and maintain themselves. Whereas again, in the kind of standard university academic context, uh, scientists uh, you know would virtually always have to have to do that in-house and because of the natural skill constraints on any given lab you know that 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 effectively circumscribes the ambition of a of a, of a possible research program um and then thirdly we try to provide career paths for people to uh to remain in science you know if they don't want to become principal investigators where the uh the university structure kind of commingles the training purpose of uh of i don't know the, the of, of academia with the uh with the um, with the execution, uh, where the people who are doing the work are typically the uh, um, the grad students and the postdocs, uh, who are both themselves at least nominally uh, on the career path of themselves eventually becoming principal investigators. And um, you know, there are lots of people who, for all sorts of different, very valid reasons, like love science and love the pursuit of research, but don't want to be a manager running a lab choosing their own research programs and dealing with all of the overhead and typically grant applications uh, that are concomitant with that. Um, and so with ARC, we have a real emphasis on hiring uh, scientists who have finished their postdocs, finished grad school, and just like that, that's what they want to do in their lives. And there, again, isn't really a, a, a career path for them today. Um, and one of the things that's actually really exciting about the discovery that we, that we mentioned that came out yesterday, this new bridge editing technology, is that work was led by one of these senior scientists <laughs> uh, who um, who'd finished his postdoc, uh, and you know, it's it's not clear to me that he wanted to uh, to go and to become a PI, um, but he loved science and he's an amazing researcher, clearly, um, and uh, and so he's able to go and to you know have that have that career um, at Arc, and you know it, uh, and in addition, uh, the you know the 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 prospect of these. Uh, mobile elements being, uh, you know, usable in this way for this like genomic insertion, whatever. That's a pretty speculative, you know, out there thing. And, you know, had he applied to the NIH to go and pursue that? I mean, you know, he didn't. So I don't know what the outcome would have been. Uh, but uh, Jennifer Doudna's uh, work was, if I recall correctly, funded by DARPA uh, because, you know, her, her CRISPR um, uh, NIH applications were were rejected. And of course, Carolyn Carrico's NIH applications, you know, for for mRNA uh, vaccine work were, were famously rejected. Uh, so, um, so it at least seems very plausible that, right. that it wouldn't have uh, it wouldn't have worked out. Um, and uh, and so, uh, look, it's all these things are random, and you know, I can't make any definitive claims about you know the what would have counterfactually happened. But it seems plausible to me that this thing announced yesterday wouldn't have happened. Or would have been less likely to happen uh, in, um, yeah, in in a different environment. Mm. Well, when we think forward, um, uh, ten years or twenty years, uh, th th this specific line where you uh, of research where you understand the effects of uh, the genetic architecture on different traits, and also you can edit, in, invert, uh, uh, insert, whatever. Um, uh, the DNA arbitrarily. Uh, I, you know, you've solved single cell anemia. You've done the obvious things. What does that lead to? What are you excited about? Well, the thing that I think is really interesting about it is um, is using it as a new kind of telescope. Um, by which I mean, what, you know, when people hear about CRISPR, um, there's um, you know, th there's an obvious excitement and a legitimate excitement around you know using this to cure things you know directly in the body, using it as a kind of therapeutic. Uh, but you can also use CRISPR to um, to try to figure out what's going on in cells and in cell cultures uh, in a in a kind of structured way, and so. Me, the you know the body is interesting in that it has this you know this this switchboard um of uh like like you know the, the DJs I guess at the um um you know with the, the, those fancy mixing sets uh uh you know of, of sort of twenty thousand genes and with CRISPR you can systematically go and sort of perturb each gene one by one like mashing all the keys uh in sequence um and try to figure out well you know what the effects of of perturbing this versus that are uh and you know, if you do that in a cell culture where, you know, you can subject the cells to some stressor or some treatment or, you know, whatever, you can kind of see differentially how different cell, how different perturbations affect different cell outcomes. 
Um, or you can just kind of use it for synthetic data generation more broadly, where you know you could perform all these perturbations and then sequence and kind of see what's happening in the cells and so forth. And you know, single cell sequencing has come a long way. Anyway, point is, there's a lot you can do with all this gene editing stuff for um, uh, uh, for discovery and for and for data generation in the broadest sense. And uh, and I, you know, that's really compelling because you know, for for a lot of diseases. Um, you know, that they're complex um, in uh, in the sort of fields jargon meaning. I mean, yes, they're complex in the colloquial sense, but they're specifically complex in that they're not um, they're not infectious, um, uh, like they're not just like some pathogen getting into you, um, and they're not monogenic, like you know Huntington's, where it's like one specific mutation. Instead, it's like some combination of environmental factors, but like maybe some genetic factors as well, and you know it's 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 somewhere in between, um, and. By figuring out, and you know, that includes most autoimmune diseases, um, most cancers, um, uh, to some extent cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative disease, like the big ones we haven't yet solved, and um, and you know, so, so then coming back to these functional genomics technologies, what's interesting I think is trying to figure out the the how it is that the genetic uh, component of those diseases happens and works and so on. Yeah. And even if that's only a small contributor, it can potentially shine light on just like what the general pathway is. And so the question would be, and look, this is this is speculative, none of this has actually happened, but by figuring out the genetic interactions between uh, genes and say Alzheimer's, can you can you figure out the, you know, how the how Alzheimer's arises, which we don't understand today. And then once you understand how Alzheimer's arises, maybe you can use kind of conventional technologies uh, and targeting to, you know, figure out how to um, how to inhibit that or to or to sort of um, you know um, modulate those pathways, uh, and uh, and so yeah, the, that that's what we're really, really excited about from a from a functional genomics standpoint. And there's kind of an AI angle as well that you know we, we could talk about if you want. Mm. Um, how, how do you think about the uh, the dual use possibilities uh, of biotech? I, I am sympathetic with the idea that like if you think of prior technology, just like Google search or even like just the computer itself, right? Uh, there, there's you could like forecast in advance, like oh, this has all this dual use stuff. Um, uh, but for some reason, just like history has been kind to us, and maybe we should just yeah. the, the, the I mean, Chesterton's metafence here is like keep doing science. But um, uh, you, you, but with biotech, there's I mean we, we don't have to go to specifics here, but there's like specific things you can think of with this specific technology. Yeah. Where you, you could imagine some nefarious things. How, how, how do you think about uh, just uh, but why not just like uh, focus, let's say, on uh, ameliorating the risks uh, first or something like that? Well, um, I don't think that uh, I don't think the binding constraint on harmful use of um, biotechnology or bioweapons today is pure biological capabilities. Like if some set of incredibly capable, uh, intelligent people wanted to, uh, wanted to, you know, cause tremendous harm with, uh, with, well, presumably with pathogens, but with something biological, um, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily need to invent anything new. They would just need to apply currently known techniques in, in kind of a malevolently directed fashion. Um, I think there are some concerns and some risks there with respect to, um, with respect to things that don't invent new technologies, um, but do um, make them more accessible, uh, and so I mean, I think the sort of, I think the question of is, um, you know, how um, what would the effect on the world be if there was a sufficiently sophisticated LLM uh, that uh, you know it could it could help anybody you know synthesize and disperse smallpox? Um, like I, I don't know that the laws of physics uh, prohibit such an LLM existing. I, I presume they don't, um, and. Would the world be fine if such an LLM was, you know, widely distributed? Like, maybe, but you know, maybe not, right? So, so I think I think there is that kind of threat factor. But my point is, I don't think um, knowledge at the frontier of biology is the is the relevant margin here. And if we take seriously what um, what um, you know that, that this is, I mean, we don't need crazy AI risk to motivate this, you know, where the world is perfectly capable of, uh, of originating, you know, really severe pandemics and pathogens itself, plus all the other diseases that are, that are not pathogenic. So, you know, we, we got other problems, but, you know, whether we care about the, the possible, you know, kind of dual use harms you just mentioned, or we just care about the things that already exist, to ameliorate both of those, we do need enhancement of our capabilities. Um, like we, um, there are there are a lot of biological problems that we don't today know how to solve. Uh, and so, 
I think in that respect, if one were to do what you're proposing and try to advance the, um, the, the, the defensive side of this, I don't know that what one would do would necessarily be that different um, uh, because there are just fundamental capabilities that we would presumably need to have um, that, we, that we don't today have. Uh, and by trying to solve current human diseases, I think you're probably also pursuing something pretty close to the best steps to solve the potential diseases that you know malicious actors could cause in the future. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, I mean, uh, zooming out from bio risk in particular, just like how are you thinking about AI these days? Well, I, I you know I, th I think I think everyone has to be sort of high perplexity um, in the sense that I mean um, the the verdict that one might have given at the beginning, you know, we're recording this here, pretty close to the beginning of 2024, the verdict one might have given at the beginning of, you know, 23, 22, 21, you know, back, say, the last eight years, those would all, I think, have looked pretty different. Um, I mean, maybe Gwern uh, might have uh, might have scored the best um, uh, from 2019 or something uh, onwards, uh, but uh, but broadly speaking, it's been pretty, pretty difficult, I think, to forecast. Um, and so I think, I think the basic position to a first order has to be one of you know some degree of humility. Um, I think as your blog post identifies, the 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 big question right now is you know to what degree um, to what degree scaling laws hold, uh, and I guess if they hold, then uh, you know what exactly is it that we're um, well asymptoting is maybe a presumptuous word, maybe it's not an asymptote, but but like what, what is it that we're approaching? You know, it's, it's not we don't necessarily know the shape of that thing, whatever it is, um, and yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot of, um, yeah, I think I think how one should feel um, needs to be uh, uh, or ought to be very sensitive to like the exact parameters of you know those curves, and I just don't think anyone anyone knows what uh what the, like the the true value of those parameters actually are. So you know it's 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 clearly going to be um, important. Uh, it is already important today, and it has a pretty central bearing on you know both uh, both Stripe and and Arc. Um, and we'll see. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if the meta lesson here, and I, I totally agree with that sort of general sentiment, but I wonder if the meta lesson that we got from COVID, for example, and with things like fast grants was, um, um, you, you obviously can't predict these things in advance, but the most important thing, even in addition to these like specific sort of countermeasures trying to come up in advance is like when the thing is happening, yes. having, uh, competent uh, individuals who can synthesize and organize information yes. and also having these like uh, new initiatives and institutions yes. to, um, uh, get the yes. right thing done. Yes. The, the, the adaptability premium is yep. probably going to go way up over the next decade. Yeah. And with that in mind, and I know you have already a couple of day jobs, <laughs> um, but yeah I, yeah, I feel like some something like fast grants, like uh, when the time comes down to it, like, I, I don't know, you like, it, it should be like, uh, you, you know, you'd be like the, uh, uh, one of the top people you could think of in terms of having expertise and respect in a wide range of domains and competency um, as a leader. Um, I, I don't know, just like keep it in the back of your mind or <laughs> maybe in the middle of your mind, given how far we are into the <laughs> transition. <laughs> well, I, fast grants was, um, was, uh, was three beloved, uh, uh, squirrels, uh, in a, in a trench coat. Um, or I guess, well, I was one of the squirrels, so, um, I don't, well, self full of it, but and uh, it was um, also with Tyler Cohen, uh, who's uh, who's an amazing person, a great friend, uh, and then my wife, um, uh, who's also uh, one of uh, one of Arc's co-founders. And so, you know, Fast Grants was not this like giant, you know, impressive edifice <laughs> that would uh, would qualify me for for anything at all. Um, but it doesn't have to be giant, right, to have that kind of big impact. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I guess as a as an objective matter, that's true. I mean, look, I, uh, I John and I try to be very self aware of the um, limits of our expertise, uh, which are. Which are you know very, <laughs> which are very proximate to us, um, and uh, I'm sure if if um, you know something like that was necessary, they'd be. I mean, uh, look at Operation Warp Speed. Um, they chose a super effective domain expert, um, Monsef Slowy, to run that, and it was just like monstrously successful, yeah. uh, uh, like truly remarkable. And um, I don't know who the Monsef Slowy of. I guess it would depend whatever the problem in question is, but I think my recommendation would be like figure out who Monsef is and like go hire Monsef. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it is extremely unlikely. That I think anybody who deemed me the Monsef of that thing, um, you know, uh, uh, is is probably mistaken. I, I think you're being too humble. But um, just staying on fast grants. Uh, 
um, you, you know, now we have the retrospective of what, how effective the FAST grants recipients were uh, compared to the other grants that were given out by, let's say, the NIH or NSF. Um, to your knowledge, what has been the reaction of these institutions to uh, the discrepancy between uh, the speed and effectiveness of FAST grants? Have they like analyzed their protocols and like what happened during COVID? Is there any sort of uh, um, retrospective there on their part? Not to my knowledge, but but I, I don't want that to sound like an indictment. Like maybe they've done a lot of reflection, and uh, and you know I just don't know about it. Like I, I don't think I would know about it even if it had happened. Um, so um, I don't know. Um, uh, I I mean, look, m most um, well, I don't know anything about the response at CDC or FDA or NIH or NSF or any of the relevant organizations or their international equivalents. And so none of what I'm saying uh, should be taken as like specifically not, not only not critical of them, but, but not even a comment to them. I just like don't know what they did. Um, but but in general, organizations are are you know not awesome at uh, at self reflection. And I, I, I think I, I assume as a default prior that some of the dynamics we discussed at the beginning of this are rooted there, where none of the people who started those organizations are there today. Um, and so you know, what exactly are the incentives of those leaders? And um, you know, uh, you know, I haven't. Um, uh, it's 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 not clear to me who would have the incentive uh, to uh, to you know really take stock in a fully objective and self critical way to to figure out you know what what was done well and what was done poorly. Mm. I promise not to be too myopic about AI, but one more question. Um, long term, we can't forecast, maybe even medium term, we can't. But near term, it looks like you know we might have things that look like AI agents, um, and they might need to trade. Uh, what does the inf financial infrastructure for AI agents look like? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and uh, I think um, I, I think automated. Um, or I don't know, autonomous uh, uh, transactions. I mean, they, they already exist in to some extent today. I mean, you know, lots of lots of services have usage based billing, right? Uh, and a lot of the expenses being incurred uh, are are you know autonomously incurred. Uh, like no no human is pushing a button when Stripe does most of what it does, you know, with cloud computing and incurs you know some 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 cost with some cloud service. So uh, it's it's in some kind of extremely primitive way happening today, and, and I assume it will follow some gradient. Uh, where some of those um, some of those decisions uh, are uh, either directly or indirectly being made by an LLM or some LLM equivalent or you know whatever, and I, I think there'll be some yeah some some almost unnoticeably smooth continuum uh, uh, up to you know very considerable degrees uh, of autonomy. But it's not that we're going to like wake up some month and be like oh my god you know s suddenly the uh, the the bots have been unleashed um, and. I think there'll be interesting questions there around. I mean, this this will now sound very kind of parochial and uh, and um, kind of uh, and um, maybe getting excessively tactical or something. But I think there'll be very interesting questions around the legality of those in terms of like are these are these treated as um, the responsibility of the of the owner or is there is there any degree of kind of independence granted? Um, uh, how does liability work? Um, how um, yeah, which which rails are best suited? What kind of transaction velocities are we talking about here? Because if it's you know a billion transactions a second, then the properties of that system should look very different. To is it you know one giant clearing transaction every day? Uh, and again, if we just use the analogy of the uh, the usage based services, those tend to incur liabilities you know in 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 kind of tiny increments, but then to kind of to settle like on a monthly basis when you pay your bill. Um, so maybe these agent transactions will have will have that of that character. So I think there were, there were a lot, excuse me, a lot of practical applied questions, but, but I think what you're saying around these autonomous um, transactions conceivably being an important dimension is, is very true and real and is, you know, one of the ways in which the, the uh, one of the interesting ways in which the economy, you know, might change and expand uh, over the next decade. And, and I think it's possible that the crypto plays some role here where, um, you know, it's, um, if you know, we, we, we take a KYC and AML mm. uh, very seriously for humans, um, and we want to know the human um, that uh, is associated with some particular financial activity, uh, 
obviously that's a, a murkier question in the context of, uh, of some AI agent. And, you know, if we, in some blurry sense, look at crypto as the part of financial services that is de facto exempt uh, from, from AML by design, uh, then, um, yeah, maybe that plays a role. How long before Stripe was founded do you think a product like Stripe could have been invented? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, in, in you know, depending on what exactly you define Stripe as being, I think um, conceivably decades earlier. Uh, in that, I mean, on some level, PayPal is a kind of Stripe, um, and you know, there were many payments companies before PayPal, and you know, you could go all the way back to you know cash registers or something, right? So, so it, it depends on on, on yeah the, these definitional questions. Um, I mean, the particular secular tailwinds that we benefited from around the rise of app stores and you know the on-demand economy and maybe the startup boom post you know YC and uh, after the financial crisis, you know th those those particular tailwinds were yeah idiosyncratic and specific to Stripe and I guess you know, the the GFC was a uh, way nine and. Uh, Stripe was founded in 2010, and so you know, <laughs> in as much as you define those as being uh, core, then not not that much earlier. But uh, but mo mo mostly, my story of Stripe is one of is one of market inefficiency, and uh, I do wonder, yeah, why why much of this didn't happen sooner. Yeah, I, I I always find it really interesting when there's these cases where um, it wasn't even the case that like well we could have been started sooner, but there was nobody in the market. There were like many people in the market, and right. they weren't just like random people. There were technology companies headquartered in San Francisco yes. who were in the market. Uh, do you have some explanation for why it didn't occur to them? I'm hesitant to generalize too much because, well, I, I only have maybe uh, you know n equals one experience, and so I think it's it's dangerous to over extrapolate from that. Um, maybe n equals two now with Arc as a I mean a very different kind of organization, but but an organization nonetheless. Or if you include um, all the features of Stripe, n equals like ten, twenty yeah, something. Right. Okay, so so, so, so <laughs> yes, depending on your definition, maybe maybe there's some kind of samples out there. I guess my general view is most products and most businesses. Um, like things can just be done much better, um, and I think I think moats are are typically kind of overrated. Uh, and I mean, the payments are a great example of a domain where, on a logical basis, you would say that there are you know so many sources of defensibility where there's there's you know the network effects of the account holders and there's the uh, data network effects slash economy of scale you know for fraud and and so forth and there are regulatory moats and barriers you know and 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 um, you know. And yet, uh, you know, not, not only does Stripe exist, but there are lots of other. I mean, there's a whole fintech ecosystem today, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it gets down to, you know, kind of deep questions of, you know, what are the, uh, what's the binding constraint on just the number of effective organizations that exist in the world, and you know, for any given sector, why is it that number of companies, you know, rather than twice that number of companies, uh, and so on? I think it's about, I don't know, motivation and ideas and people's, you know, willingness and determination to organize talent and so forth. But 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 these kinds of more sociocultural explanations, rather than, um, I mean, Hamilton Helmer is probably the leading scholar of some of the. Um, the sources of defensibility for businesses. Um, yeah, he has this, uh, you know, kind of niche but very well known in the niche book uh, 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 called uh, Seven Powers, uh, and uh, it, it it kind of attempts to disaggregate all the various sources of uh, of market power in this respect. Um, and you know, I think that is true and important uh, insofar as it goes. Um, but none, nonetheless, it's kind of yeah strange to me that nobody had done Stripe before Stripe. Mm. When you think about the uh, the fact that moats are overrated and just like doing the thing is underrated, does that like what is Stripe's mode in that context? Does that make you uh, you know the thing differently about Stripe's mode? I th um, yes, one um, and I guess I I guess I do think that um, that w one can have. Um, Organizational and cultural moats, um, and so, I mean maybe this contradicts what I was just saying, or maybe it's consistent with it in the sense that it's a kind of cultural explanation. Um, and uh, I think that in as much as we have a moat, it's because we have a very good understanding of our domain and a set of people who actually care about solving the problems um, and who are. I don't know, continually paranoid at the prospect that we might be forgetting something important and sort of trying to figure out what the important thing that could supplant Stripe's approaches is and making sure that we build those first uh, and so forth. I, I, th I think um, organizations that are, I mean, there's, um, um, you're familiar with Conquest's laws uh, and there's uh, Conquest's 
uh, third law, I guess, uh, which is that uh, one should model organizations as if they're run by a cabal of their enemies. Right, right. Um, and, you know, obviously it's, or presumably it's tongue in cheek, uh, but, you know, it's interesting to try to think about like, well, kind of what is the kernel of truth in that and why would it be there? And I think what's going on is that I think most organizations, when they start out, are actually trying to achieve their stated goals. Um, like somebody started the organization for a reason and, and probably it was for the stated reason. Um, but then over time, you know, that person and that you know, set of people who initially populate the organization depart and some set of new people come to you know, take their place. And there's, there's you know, multiple versions of that, there's, there's generational turnover on a, on a continuous yeah. basis. Um, but say for the fifth generation, like why are they there and to what degree do kind of their particular specific local incentives align with the nominal originally stated uh, goals of the organization? And I, I think there can be a lot of misalignment there, right? Where they're following a, a, a local path um, and, um, and conceivably even the leader of the organization, not even through any like fault of their own per se necessarily, just that they, they're a human and they have their own incentives. And again, the original kind of constitutional incentives of the, of the organization might be quite different. Um, and so yeah, I, I think this I think this phenomenon is is kind of a fact of life and uh, and I think these kinds of explanations for me um, are um, are much more explanatory in trying to figure out sort of why some of these things either happen or don't uh, and to your question like in as much as stripe has a moat what is it uh, I think it's that um, I mean others can judge to what degree it's actually you know, manifest and rooted in practice. I think it is, but you know, I'm a biased observer, but uh, I think it would be that people at Stripe really care about solving the problems that we say we are trying to solve. Mm. Yeah. I, the, the, the point about the misalignment over generations or over time is interesting. Um, and it, actually, do you have examples of institutions which have for decades or hundreds of years managed to keep their original not only mission statement, but the organizational uh, competence. Because you think of tech companies, even the oldest tech companies have not been allow around that long, right? Yeah. And they're some of the biggest tech companies in the world. And the median age of the corporation is like famously low. Uh, what what is a good examples here? I think some of the explanations around the uh, the effects of shareholder capitalism and sort of the idea that mm -hmm. shareholder capital capitalism as a mechanism does, in fact, have um, have you know, uh, has some consequence with respect to the uh, incentives or of organizations and their long-term fates. Um, I think those theories have some credibility and I think it is very plausible that uh, shareholder capitalism even attenuates uh, the the, um, the duration of some of these organizations. I'm not saying that's definitively true, but I, I find it you know, incredible, the, the idea that it is. Um, it's not clear to me that that's necessarily bad, even if it is true, right? Uh, in that, are we on the side of the humans or the kind of aggregate innovation in the world or on the side of like the corporations, you know, qua legal entities. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not clear to me the answer it should be the third. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, or maybe in fact consistent with that, you know, if, if you look at say Europe or, you know, some other places like, you know, in, in Denmark, um, there's uh, for, for reasons uh, uh, related to the, the tax code there, a lot of organizations um, are either controlled by or, you know, very substantially held by, um, by, uh, uh, non-profit foundations, uh, and so Novo Nordisk, for example, you know the the, the GLP company, uh, but uh, but Maersk, the shipping company, um, I believe also Lego. Uh, a lot of these corporations are are um, are controlled by, um, and again, usually have a lot of their stock held by foundations. That has the secondary effect um, in many cases where they actually do embed in a legally binding constitution their mission. Um, and so, you know, I'm not an expert on Novo Nordisk, but um, I was. I was um, I happened to get a book about it over Thanksgiving, uh, and um, my um, uh, and actually there's also a book on the Danish industrial foundations. Um, uh, but it's enshrined in their constitution that they have to make insulin, you know, broadly available, uh, really cheaply, or at least cheaply mm. in Scandinavian countries. And then I think they're allowed to charge market prices elsewhere. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, and then the the you know the, the rest of their of their profits they have to uh, they're they're again legally obligated to reinvest in R and D. Um, you know. Is that somehow causal in the fact that they then invented, you know, one of the most remarkable uh, pharmacological discoveries of the last twenty years uh, in these uh, in these, you know, GLP one uh, agonists? I mean, you know, plausibly, um, and uh, and so I think, um, yeah, I, I think I think these questions around, you know, the the you know why it is that the median age of organizations, you know, and corporations is what it is are 
are definitely interesting. And um, I, I suspect it's a somewhat contingent aspect of how we've chosen to organize large corporations you know, in the US today. The, the thing you're mentioning about uh, this firm seems very similar to the export-led growth in Asian uh, uh, totally, so, 100%. right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You have tariffs. I mean, this one company you're tasked with making the cars, but you better make the cars good. Um, you, you, have, you have no competition, but you had to invent the best car in the world. Yes, yes, yes. And I think, I mean, you know, we are all fans uh, of you know Smith and Ricardo and you know all these characters, um, and um, and you know even they, I think, are, are sort of less dogmatically uh, attached to free trade uh, than perhaps you know people today interpret them as being but but I think pe people like you know Friedrich List uh, and you know those other not quite contemporaries but you know quasi contemporaries um uh you know are, are maybe on a relative basis underrated and I do think I mean in as much as you believe the kind of sociological cultural skill whatever um even vague alignment um uh, not in the AI sense but in the <laughs> just in the, in the more sure. kind of interpersonal sense in as much as you think these are, are important and explanatory then um then yeah I think uh you know you you end up thinking about some of the things the things you just raised that, that's really interesting to hear you say that, because if you think about Stripe's mission, right, it's to uh, uh, facilitate global trade, to make sure that uh, some firm from India can compete with any firm in Nigeria yeah. or whatever. Um, so like the, the, the room for you to have this sort of learning curve where you're less efficient than the global competition should be less if Stripe exists, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Is, isn't Stripe the anti-list uh, company? <laughs> um, well, it depends which, which version of list. Um, and, you know, I mean, and to, to be clear, I'm not sort of specifically endorsing these uh, these. Know, tariffs and uh, and trade barriers. I think the the, the history associated <laughs> with them is is checkered sure. um, uh, at best. Look, I, I think it's possible that if you have a like a specific sector where you have um, where you have you know clear goals and a credible path to actually achieving some substantial degree of success there, you know, and 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 probably some more kind of conjoined propositions, then maybe uh, some degree of uh, of uh, of activist uh, trade policy, you know, m might be uh, on net the um, the uh, the beneficial thing to do. I don't think that uh, that de describes most sectors in most countries right. at most times. <laughs> uh, and yeah, huh, that's so interesting. Um, is uh, I'm trying to. I think th there's an interesting thread here and in how it relates to Stripe Climate in that you're I don't know like subsidizing these learning curves that these uh, East Asian countries did for their own co internal companies. Um, I mean, you, I mean, you haven't picked out like a specific company that's going to necessarily be the Kia of uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. carbon sequestration. But yeah, how do you think about this? Well, maybe a way to unify so, um, the, the 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 two points, and I'll speak about Stripe Climate in a second. Um, is that I think. Uh, I guess it's um, it's Say's law um, about you know demand right. creating supply, and in as much as Stripe aggregates more and more global demand, uh, I guess part of the I don't know, it, it seems too self-aggrandizing to call it you know the the theory of Stripe, but you know some some vague hunch in Stripe uh, is that, uh, that 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 aggregation of demand can have important uh, expansionary effects with respect to the ensuing supply, uh, and yes, yeah, Stripe climate is is some version of this you know hypothesis applied on a much scholar, smaller scale than Stripe itself, but 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 still you know real and and well we'll see maybe important, uh, and the, the the basic idea just for for folks who aren't familiar, which I assume is most of your audience, <laughs> um, uh, so we we. We observed in 2018, I guess, that uh, that everyone seems to agree that carbon removal will be very important. Um, and um, you know, even if we decarbonize the economy on the kind of timescale that optimistic people, um, you know, on the most optimistic uh, timeframes, there'll still be you know an accumulated stock of carbon that you know, is a problem. Um, it sounded pretty weird. Uh, there were there were virtually no uh, uh, carbon removal companies in the world uh, in 2018. Maybe there were you know, two or three or something. Uh, no companies had ever purchased from a carbon removal company. These were these were really sort of science projects. And so we thought, well, you know, <laughs> somebody's got to start, uh, and it might be valuable to you know not only transfer some dollars, but to kind of confer some credibility on this sector. Not that Stripe is the world's most credible company, but you know it's better than nothing. Uh, and so we started contracting with some of these carbon removal companies. Um, that went pretty well, and, and and they seemed kind of appreciative of us, and so we, we thought somewhat more about this, and we uh, then in 2021 uh, formed Frontier, which is an AMC, an advanced market commitment. So inspired by um, the the first AM, yeah, AMC, which was a, uh, a pre commitment to purchase vaccines for uh, uh, developing world countries for diseases that, I mean, uh, well, either were kind of market failures where pharma companies hadn't pursued the vaccines or or were just like the profits weren't sufficient to, to pay for the program. So we had to do this for carbon removal. We raised a billion dollars. Uh, Stripe was um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the first investor 
we're not actually investing, we're just buying. So they're, they're the first company to commit. Um, but then we're joined by Shopify and Alphabet and Meta and JP Morgan and uh, a bunch of other companies. Um, and now there's now there's like a fairly active sector of carbon removal companies. Uh, there, are, I think, uh, Frontier has contracted with forty between forty and fifty companies. Um, the overwhelming majority of which didn't exist when we start start out with this. And actually, we, we ran an anonymous survey uh, back um, the end of last year, and you know we asked them to what degree was as was the existence of Frontier. You know. Uh, somewhat causal in you know, their starting the company in the first place. And again, there's an anonymous survey. And I think it was 70, 74% of the companies said that Frontier you know, played a causal role uh, in their starting the company. So yeah, I think, um, I think this, these inducement effects uh, can, be, can be pretty significant. Yeah, that, that's, that's huge. Well, what are other ideas you've come across where an AMC would be an uh, effective instrument of moving forward the tech? Hmm, that's a good question. We've, we've actually been having some of that discussion internally, um, just it's not that we plan on doing it ourselves necessarily, but um, just wondering are there, you know, are there, <laughs> are there people we should share our technology with? Not that it's even technology per se, uh, but but uh, share our experience with or something and, and try to help along. Um, I mean, there's still, I think there's still a lot of stuff in 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 the biomedical field, um, and I mean, patents are. Um, you know, patents are are pretty useful insofar as they go, but you know, they, they there's a lot of um, there's a lot of innovation that seems like it would be, you know, socially beneficial that p patents don't provide a way to cover the cost of, um, and so, you know, there, there was some excitement um, a few years ago about uh, mannose, uh, which is a it's a sugar, um, and. Um, there was one paper that, uh, or maybe a few papers, uh, I, I can't remember, that, that suggests that maybe maybe tumors will selectively take up mannose rather than glucose, uh, but they can't actually metabolize it properly and so they, they just die. Uh, and so, you know, maybe this could be an effective, um, you know, uh, onco-treatment of, uh, of some sort. Um, but mannose is, is like, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a generic sugar. It's been, you know, understood for, I, I guess, more than a century, uh, and you couldn't patent it, importantly. Um, and so it's not clear who has the incentive to even you know, fund the work to test you know, whether or not this would actually work in practice. And you know, <laughs> this is not an endorsement of, uh, of Manos, but just there, there, there are things of this shape uh, where there's something where you can clearly see, wow, that, that might be very beneficial, but it's not totally clear how the kind of economic structure of the market can, can make it possible. So I think there are still a lot of those uh, across the biomedical landscape. I mean, look, there are still a lot of vaccines uh, that you know, could in principle exist that, that don't. I mean, Lyme disease, uh, you know, there's no, um, there's, there's one vaccine that, uh, that was withdrawn from the market over some safety concerns that I, I, th I think were misplaced, but you know, uh, but it's still no vaccine. Um, uh, outside, it's not even that well understood, right? Like people have right. chronic Lyme disease, we yeah. don't know like if it's legit or not. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and, but it, 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 it's a good question. I mean, I, look, maybe some of your listeners will know, uh, yeah, we'll have ideas for, for fields where you know, we, we, we sorely need an AMC. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, I want to go back to Stripe for a second. So uh, you, you're famously um, uh, you know, appreciative of craft and beauty, but also you appreciate the power of scale and growth. Is there a type and of speed? Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Um, it, but, but is there a type of craft uh, that is just not amenable to speed, growth, scale? If you think like a Japanese chef, he's like learning to cook rice for you know, a decade and then he can move on to the sushi or something. Uh, is that just not competitive in the modern world? Craft, um, scale, and, and speed. I don't know they're strictly necessarily intention in every case, but they're definitely frequently intention. So just yes, I think is, is kind of one short answer to, to that. At the same time, um, a lot of the most successful companies um, are those that I think are distinguished by the extent to which they, they exhibit um, appreciation for and like skill in realizing craft um, and, and beauty. Uh, and so LVMH is one of the largest companies in the world and like that's literally their business. Um, I mean, I, th I think Tesla is pretty good at this. Uh, I mean, they're good at many things, but you know, including this. Um, obviously there's Apple. Um, I mean, TSMC is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's not the, the Japanese uh, sushi chef you, you, uh, you mentioned, but it is the, it's the TSMC chip sushi chef yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in Taiwan. Uh, and, and so much, again, tacit knowledge and, you know, difficult to, 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 to transfer skills. Um, so, 
I, I think it might be the case that um, that craft uh, and the pursuit of it is is as important as as it's ever been, um, and and certainly as as Stripe has gotten larger, I think we ourselves have come to greater conviction in this. Where I, I think part of what's interesting about um, the, these aesthetic qualities is. They're generally speaking unquantifiable. I don't know if they're intrinsically unquantifiable. Like maybe you could like train a model to do so uh, or, or something. But today they're they're broadly speaking unquantifiable, and yet they are actually, um, you know, they they influence people in significant ways. People very demonstrably care about aesthetics, um, and they care about you know if they're a company, they care about the aesthetic characteristics of the products that you know they produce. Just like on an intuitive pe- uh, level, people know that that's true, but. You know, yeah, it's 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 difficult to manage that uh, at a, at an organizational level where there isn't a, a P and L associated with it, and if you're screwing it up, you you don't see a neat time series uh, decline. But over the 14 years of Stripe, you know, we have, I guess, through a kind of not exactly trial and error, but just by studying cases where things worked well at Stripe and cases where things worked less well, and what customers responded well to, and so on, it really seems clear to us that even in a domain like ours, where we are selling primarily to businesses, um, that this is something that's that's truly important. Um, and also that in as much as, you know, getting back to what we were discussing previously, you want, um, in, in as much as the, the sociology um, and the kind of cultural explanations of defensibility are real, the best people you know, consider themselves craftspeople in their domain, right. and they really, above almost all else, want to work with the best other people. And so, I think it's it it may almost be true that even if, from a customer facing standpoint, uh, craft was not valued by the market, you actually might still want to build an organization that indexes very heavily on this because you you just want the best people for other reasons. Mm-hmm. And now, as it happens, I think customers do, in fact, value it. And I think the evidence is, is broadly consistent with that. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, I think, um, I think it's very hard to assemble groups of the best people if you don't take the practice of the work super seriously. Mm. Uh, what kind of beauty or craft or simplicity is more important, interface or implementation? There's famously that essay that Unix is successful because the implementation is simple and not the interface. Yeah, the, I guess the interface is kind of simple, um, but it there's a lot of like asterisks and caveats and you know edge cases that that yeah, I guess Unix doesn't handle for you. Um, uh, but Stripe does, right? I mean, look, pr- presumably it depends what you're what you're building, right? Uh, for for TikTok, it's probably more important that their interface is simple, and even if their implementation's a mess, you know that's that's probably okay. Uh, nothing it is. I have no idea. Um, uh, whereas for Stripe, uh, yeah, people are people are on some level purchasing our architecture or mm. you know purchasing their ability to do certain things and some set of things rather than some different set of things you know be, because of what our architecture makes easy and what and uh, and makes possible now i don't think i mean if by interface you mean the, the visual you know gui interface um, then you know maybe we can draw some separation there but i guess we we don't really draw that distinction like we think of the interface to stripe as being the architecture right. uh, we're, huh. we're we're selling um, you know <laughs> No one else seems to agree with me, but I often think of Stripe in the, um, as similar to Mathematica, uh, where we're selling kind of a a, a, um, a self-contained universe to model whatever it is uh, um, is of interest to you, and that that you know you care about. And we're providing some primitives and some um, some yes, kind of interfaces and tools and so forth to enable your modeling. Um, but fundamentally, we're helping you do something in your own terms. Uh, and you know, in that sense, I don't think kind of the architecture and the, and the interface are, are necessarily that separable. That, that, that's a really interesting analogy. Um, although, I mean, if you think of Mathematica, the, the, like the entry that that's giving you to is, you know, just like the platonic objects of math. Right. Whereas for you guys, it's like the entry is to like visa error codes, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> like the, the end yeah. object is not the, uh, the, you know, the platonic. Uh... That, that's, that's true, <laughs> though, in, in, in both cases. Yeah, I think, y- yes. Uh, so, so the analogy falls down in, in a few respects. Um, but um but look, I mean, the idea of a transaction is pretty fundamental um, and is, you know, roughly as old as, you know, the, the quadratic equation uh, or something. <laughs> I, I guess the transaction's older. And, uh, and Mathematica, especially today, excuse me, 
today now supports all kinds of, I mean, to a very impressive extent, supports all kinds of like crazy arcane stuff. Like if you go through the more obscure packages in Mathematica, you can definitely find things that are, uh, I think, much less broadly uh, employed and, and understood even than, than visa error codes or something. So, <laughs> but, but yes, look, these are not the same. It's more just, I, I find it to be a kind of a, an interesting source of intuition. And I think what, what Wolfram has done with Mathematica is pretty amazing. Yeah. I, I, another uh, way in which I'm curious uh, how you think about this, uh, one way in which uh, Mathematica may be different is if they had to make a change in Mathematica, like big deal, somebody has to learn new syntax. If you make a change, you know, it's like uh, billions of dollars of uh, um, yeah. uh, transactions don't happen. Right. Uh, like what, how does that change the way you think about the initial architecture and just the stakes? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, well, actually, for, <laughs> first of all, then just beauty with respect to architecture, then I'll, then I'll answer yeah, that, yeah. That, that one. So, um, just as, as a side note, I guess, I, I think it's interesting that API design in general mm. doesn't get more study as a discipline and as a practice. Um, I think it I think it plays a significant role in the fate of platforms um, uh, or can. I'm not saying it's always the determinative thing. Uh, and, and if you get it right, I, you know, there can be compounding positive benefits, you know, and the converse. And I, I think it's really striking that with... Um, say with you know, mobile app development, which was one of the most dynamic and fast moving ecosystems of the past 10 or 15 years, that you know, so many of the objects and the classes, uh, uh, say in iOS development, uh, are prefixed with NS, uh, less so now with Swift, but you know, for, for much of the iPhone's history. Um, and you know, the NS, of course, refers to next step, you know, back from next in the 90s. But that when you get um, API design and architecture right, it can be so enduring uh, over literally multiple decades, uh, and you know, even in the face of what are otherwise kind of frenzied evolutions um, in everything around it. Uh, and Unix, of course, is kind of another example of this. Where yes, Unix has tons of shortcomings, but like the, the architecture has basically worked for now, you know, more than um, I guess around half a century. Uh, and and so you know, we, we talk. We're, we're always trying to impress upon people at Stripe. The importance of multi-decadal abstractions, and I, I think people sometimes um, uh, respond to that, thinking that that's some insanely lofty, kind of Im implausibly ambitious, um, I don't know, hyperbola. But no, I, th I think that's actually just what happens uh, when you when you get this stuff right, uh, and um, and and if in fact you get a rise, you 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 can just reap these or re really the people building on your platform can read these uh, incredible benefits for, for a very long time. Um, to the Mathematica point, th they, I know, take backwards compatibility really seriously, uh, where you can uh, run um, programs you know, written 20 years ago, unchanged, uh, in today's Mathematica. That really raises the stakes uh, in API design for sort of obvious reasons. Uh, and we have that same problem ourselves, uh, where when we think about int introducing something new, it's not just does this like exigently address the particular need that's motivating it today? But, you know, do we think we can stand behind this, uh, you know, in, in 2044? Um, and, yeah. um, and how do we think the world might evolve around us such that it all remains coherent? And we certainly don't always get that right, but that's, that's on some of what we're trying to do. Is Visa net an example of this? And one might even say that one of the downsides of being able to use implementation for many decades in the future is even if it's it's self-sustainable and you have this ecosystem and equilibrium set around it, uh, if you um, you know can't modify it uh, just because of people's right. local incentives, you get stuck in this uh, equilibrium that's worse than it could be otherwise. I see. I see. Um, I think the card networks generally, Visa and Mastercard, um, are. You know, are, are, are pretty good equilibrium um, where it, it's easy to judge today um, with you know, the world as it exists in 2024. But I think you have to look at the world as it was when they started out uh, and the particular problems that they're solving. And I think when you compare the I don't know, financial landscape in, in the US or in the Western world to those in other places, it's certainly not clear to me that the US has, um, has gotten you know, a, a bad hand, so to speak, or is, is somehow stuck in any meaningful way. Um, so, you know, the card networks do a couple of things. They, uh, they originally they um, you know, they were they were designed to uh, to replace a store credit uh, and to uh, and I mean for, for the I mean it was a credit card originally, not a debit card, right? right? Uh, 
and and that was important. And you know, the the availability of structured consumer credit, I think, is actually a, a pretty big deal and and pretty beneficial, and especially beneficial typically for for lower income people. Um, and then you know, with the advent, I guess, of of jet travel and you know, mass market um, uh, tourism and so forth, then you know, it it uh, they helped supplant travelers checks and uh, and. You know, various worse alternatives like carrying you know cash around in your little bag, uh, and uh, and then with the internet, you know they, they were substantially involved in enabling online transactions, um, and you know I think that they the fact that they got the architecture so right that so much of this you know so many of these uh, uh, different use cases were able to be addressed by their core design is is just really impressive and like the guy who designed all this D Hawk uh, I think is is I mean he was just he was a remarkable person uh, and even I mean people complain about. Uh, interchange and right. I mean, lest I sound like a defender of you know the uh, the card ecosystem. I mean, it's like Stripe is on the well, it depends. You could look at multiple ways, but like <laughs> many people would consider Stripe to be on the wrong side uh, of the uh, of the interchange cost uh, uh, equation in the sense that you know we are we're giving away the interchange revenue to to other companies, and so I don't think I'm um, structurally biased uh, in favor of interchange. Uh, and yet, I will say, I think it's pretty interesting what Interchange made possible, where it's it's a uh, it's a distribution incentive fee, uh, where you're paying other entities to go and like do the work of recruiting these customers and convincing them to get a card, and you know, getting them to maintain the card and to pay it off at the end of the month, and like all this stuff. So you're you're paying for that, just the pure distribution. Like there's a person at the end of the flight telling you, "Hey, sign up for the, you know, the United <laughs> Credit Card, or whatever." But like you know, that's that's what interchange that's is paying case. for. <laughs> yeah. That guy annoys me. <laughs> well, um, uh, we'll, we'll 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 get to the counterfactuals in a second. Um, so there's there's that. There's you know, paying for the actual credit issuance it's, itself. Um, and then there's you know the customer support and you know all the ancillary uh, things around it, the, the the dispute handling and so forth. Um, and then I, th I think it is interesting to look at the cases where, for whatever contingent reason, uh, uh, you know the card networks didn't arise. So Germany is you know one of the the, the classic ones. And like dealing with the, I mean, from our vantage point at least, dealing with the online economy in Germany as compared to the US is so much worse. Uh, like if if Stripe could push a button and have you know really broadly adopted cards in Germany, ally the US, we would like push the hell out of that button, right? Um, you can look at China, which on the one hand does have um, does have uh, 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 you know, uh, Alipay and uh, and WePay or you know, WeChat payments um, are are really ubiquitous, and so in that sense they're they're very digitally enabled uh, from a transactional standpoint. Um, but those products don't tend to be as sophisticated with uh, with consumer credit, and so yes, the kind of the, the transaction fees for transferring money that you in fact already have are you know that's super cheap. But I think you need to look at it on kind of a fully loaded basis where, okay, but what about the cost of actually getting the credit to make the purchase in the first place, you know, as a credit card would enable. And I think as you look at these other, other counterfactuals in other places, you, one feels a kind of, uh, you know, gratitude for right, sure. what it is that DHOC and, you know, uh, and Visa and, uh, and MasterCard and the card networks made possible. And look, I'm not saying they're perfect or anything, but uh, I think that... Um, uh, I'm I'm most interested in critiques. Um, and I'm not saying again that one can't make them, but just I'm, I'm most interested in critiques from people who've really studied sure. uh, the ecosystems of other countries, yeah. uh, because I think it's easy to uh, uh, underestimate what we um, what we uh, what we got in their invention. Mm. Yeah, maybe there's a sort of Chesterton and Spence kind of thing uh, here going on here. If you had to design payments from first principles now. Uh, does it make sense that, you know, all these things you mentioned, uh, taking on credit risk, uh, the chance of fraud, disputed adjudication, uh, should that cost like two, 3% of each transaction that happens in the economy? Like if, uh, what would payments look like if you had to design that from first principles? Well, we're, we're seeing a, um, live version of this experiment play out, um, for the, for the first time in you know, many years in, in a number of countries today where central banks are becoming more active in designing national payment schemes. Uh, and so uh, PIX in Brazil uh, launched in late 2020, I think. Um, uh, but it, it's, a, it's, I mean, you, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've heard of you know, UPI, the um, central bank. The, the, UPI was kind of the, the, the instigator here, where it's the central bank payment system in, in India. And uh, it was you know, tied up with Aadhaar and their national identity system and so on. But that inspired a lot of central bankers in other countries to go and build their own UPIs. And so, yeah, PIX in Brazil launched in 2020. And uh, now a significant majority of all Brazilian adults are like weekly active users of PIX. Uh, again, even though it launched in 2020, so it, it just had this uh, incredibly uh, rapid uh, adoption curve. Uh, you have um, Swish in Sweden. Uh, you've, you know, uh, there's a, I mean, 
across East Asia, Japan, uh, Thailand, uh, Switzerland, you know, central bank after central bank uh, are deciding, hey, you know, we should have our version of this. And so this is a kind of uh, reinvention of, uh, of the payment system from scratch. Um, for kind of hard to understand reasons, um, yeah, things typically seem like once you layer in the customer support and the consumer protection and the uh, fraud prevention and the anti-money laundering controls, um, and the credit, you know, the things just for some weird reasons seem to asymptote at around, you know, two or 3%. It's important to also note that a lot of the two or 3%, you know, beyond just covering the costs, much of the surplus ends up getting, um, getting remitted to consumers in the form of rewards, not in every country, but in many countries. Uh, and, um, and if you look at the, uh, the, um, the, uh, public reports from, you know, various banks in the U S, uh, like the, their interchange revenue where, you know, they're getting these, um, you know, delicious fees on every transaction, you know, as you put it, like a lot of that is going straight back out the door to the consumers themselves and so on. So anyway, it, it's not clear how exactly one should think about the economics. Like if it's going back to the consumer, should you include that as a transaction tax or is it just like a weird sort of uh, a weird circular relationship? <laughs> um, I've not seen any evidence to suggest that the, uh, that the 2% or thereabouts is, massively inefficient uh, in the in the scheme of things. Um, I'm not saying it's the optimal level, maybe 1% would be better, but you know, within some range of 1% to 3%, it's, it's, uh, it's probably reasonable. Um, the, um, I mean, as, as, as we think about uh, some of these, um, these, I don't know, um, these ad valorem fees and, you know, figures, uh, the, I think the place where there's um, even more change at the moment that I that we find ourselves thinking more about is actually the changing structure of global tax, mm -hmm. uh, where um, you know the, the, the idea of you know, the, the, there's been a reasonable amount of innovation, uh, I guess, in the in the tax domain over the last you know century, where um, you know income taxes got pretty high, and then we you know value added taxes and so on. Like the new thing, um, uh, at least you know in the online context, is uh, is um, uh, uh, jurisdictions remitting, uh, or, or excuse me, are in, uh, imposing sales taxes on businesses that don't have any kind of locus in the jurisdiction in question. So you're a, um, you know, you're a podcaster <laughs> in uh, in the Bay Area, and uh, you know the 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 Dwarkesh merch store, um, you know, sh sh uh, will have to pay. Um, you know, the the the, uh, the town of Uppsala in Sweden uh, will have a special. Uh, a special tax on baseball caps, um, and you know you will need to know about that particular tax on baseball caps and any baseball caps that you are selling to the Upsalans. You know you will have to collect that amount from the buyer, um, report to Uppsala, uh, and uh, and uh, and then eventually figure out how you're going to like get that money to Uppsala. And obviously it's this like combinatoric uh, problem of you know buyer jurisdictions um, and uh, and. Uh, you know, product types, and then all the different uh, jurisdictions that you have to you know, remit the uh, the money to, um, and you know those th those amounts. You know, they're they're we're not talking you know three basis points. You know, the the the, the taxes in question are often you know five percent or ten percent or something. So it's it's not trivial, uh, and so just as I think about sort of the uh, the the funds flows on the internet and like how all that's evolving and unfolding, I think changes in tax law are actually a much bigger deal than anything about the transactional economics. Yeah, yeah. But by the way, it's not the Workash Podcast, it's Lunar Society Podcast LLC, registered on Stripe Atlas. Um, so any, 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 any merchandise I sell in the future, it'll, Stripe will take care of that. Yes. Okay, well, if there's ever any uh, Stripe complaints, we, um, we No, it's great. Uh, it's been super useful, honestly. Like, it, it would have been a much more difficult to get business to operations well, going. Do, uh, do you think, um, sorry, I know you're supposed to be interviewing me no, and other folks, but um, did, did Stripe play any, like, even on the margins, counterfactual role in you charging for anything? Because this is the thing we're always interested in. Like, when we talk about sort of growing the GDP of the internet, it's not like get the existing GDP onto our rails. It's sort of, you know, where on the margin can we can we cause there to be economic activity that isn't already occurring? So, yeah, I, like, you I, I, you did, in fact, uh, start the start the podcast, you know, before before incorporating. But, you know, were we, in, you know, uh, causal in any fashion in, like, the merch or any anything uh, of that nature? Um, 
I, I, I like uh, to the extent that like Substack would not be able like a convenient place to get payments yeah. from um, yeah. to begin with. Right. That, that's like definitely a thing. And also, you know, you, if I do, you, you wouldn't charge for the newsletter if Substack hadn't made it super easy. Yeah, and also mm. if I do like an ad or something, it's yeah, just like yeah, I yeah. wouldn't even know how to begin with uh, getting the money if I didn't already have an LLC uh, right. through Stripe that yeah. uh, with an associate bank account that I can get money through. So yeah, yeah probably kind of factually responsible for uh, uh, a lot of the monetization. Ah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, appreciate it. <laughs> of course. Um, so what are some unexpected um, compliments to payment processing you see in the future? So, uh, you know, all this stuff, Atlas, identity fraud detection, um, of, you know, in retrospect, uh, it might have not have been obvious uh, the back then there was a good compliment. Now it does seem that way. What would be like this in five, 10 years? Um, honestly, our problem ends up being that um, you know, t too many things, um, uh, you know, more things that we can possibly pursue mm -hmm. look like compliments, right? Uh, in that, um, you know, every business almost by definition has revenue. Uh, and so we, we obviously want to help them, uh, generate and accept and manage and orchestrate, you know, everything pertaining to that revenue. But, uh, once you're, you know, once you're in that flow and, and you kind of just go through the, the steps of running a business, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh a lot, a lot else looks relevant and somehow connects quite directly. You know, we're 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 not um for, for the I mean, when, when Stripe started out, uh, Stripe seemed like it definitely wasn't cool. Uh, it was it was sort of the opposite, where it was just a, sort of a couple of us, and we thought that we could make this. Um, the superior payments API, uh, and for the vast majority of its um, history, uh, Stripe has, I think, attracted people who are uh, drawn to um, unglamorous infrastructure challenges and problems. And, uh, you know, we're not a company that specializes in, you know, making beautiful cars. Uh, we, we make roads. Uh, and, um, and I bring all of that up at, uh, because I think it's relevant to this kind of compliment question where, you know, in our discussions internally, a lot of it and by the significant majority of it is still about, okay, where are there actual practical shortcomings and limitations in even our core bread and butter? And that's not, I mean, payment processing might be a slightly too limited term to use for it. Uh, maybe it's more about just global programmable um, money orchestration, mm -hmm. uh, which yes, is consumer to business payments, of, you know, the sort that we were just discussing in say the context of your sub stack, but it's also business to business payments. Uh, it's also payments where there's credit or lending involved. Uh, it's also how you hold money. It's how you convert money between different currencies. Um, it's how you represent money that's held by different legal entities uh, and how we make it possible for even individuals or small businesses to act as kind of micro multinationals uh, and all this kind of stuff. But those problems that we just skimmed over um, are all, even though they all directly pertain to the movement of money, they're not small, um, and if you know, if if we could just solve those uh, really, uh, really effectively, uh, then you know Stripe will be a, a very you know, uh, consequential organization, and I think force in the world. Um, and you know, I think the counterfactual importance of building some of this stuff as we go to newer markets that are you know, on a relative basis more poorly served is actually increasing rather than shrinking. Like in the US, there were payments companies before Stripe and maybe if Stripe had never done its thing, like eventually you'd have found some way to you know, monetize uh, a newsletter or something like that. But uh, if you're in, you know, um, if you're in um, Albania, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, the set of options available to you is uh, far more restricted. And so I think that, yeah, the marginal impact uh, as, we, as we expand low, uh, globally increases quite a bit. So anyway, that's all to say that even though we are interested in and, and do today pursue uh, some of these direct adjacencies, uh, I think that the core problem uh, of global sort of money orchestration mm. uh, remains remains a really yeah, just big and unsolved problem. Mm. Does that look like being a better interface for all these complexities and glossing them over? under the seven lines of code? Or does that look like actually replacing the rails and the infrastructure uh, to, to make all this more efficient and effective? The, the former, the former. Like it, it's just not that useful to build financial ecosystems that are self-contained, right? Um, a financial island um, is uh, is not that helpful. It's it's much more, 
valuable to build, um, I don't know, a, a financial, um, this is mixing metaphors, uh, but, uh, you know, a, a financial uh, air network uh, or something. But I think uh, we would much prefer that Stripe plugged into every existing um, system and rail and, uh, and uh, uh, domestic um, domestic organization rather than that we tried to you know come along and supplant them and and this has been Stripe's strategy very deliberately from the beginning uh, where uh, you know th there were lots of companies when Stripe started out that were trying to sort of do their own thing and and go their own way where whereas our belief was you get these I mean it's classic I guess Metcalf law stuff of you know by by enhancing the capabilities of an existing ecosystem uh, you you create create quite a bit more value. Mm. Okay, let's go back to Stripe. Um, is Stripe a writing culture for the benefit of the writer or the reader? It can be both. <laughs> but which one's the more so? I, I think there are actually really considerable benefits on both sides um, because for the reader, it's it's not just that it's maybe more efficient to communicate stuff through text, though in many cases it is, but also there's like this intertemporal benefit uh, where you know future readers can try to understand the uh, the through line and the thought process that you know, led us to this mm. point. Um, and, and I think that's, yeah, very considerable. But it's also true that I think the the I mean I I I, I guess I write things and lots of people write things in order to organize one's own thoughts and you know if if that kind of ability was uh, was taken away from me I think I'd be you know, meaningfully less effective so you know, how, how exactly those balance out is is, is hard to say um, maybe m maybe the uh, the I mean they're not actually separable that, that that's my answer mm -hmm. um, like. Literate cultures uh, are just a different thing. And I don't mean literate in some kind of faux intellectual way. I just mean maybe textual cultures um, is is a better term here, uh, where um, you know uh, um, Bruno Latour spoke about how um, you know he he thinks part of how the um, the printing revolution, um, like Gutenberg's. Uh, uh, caused the scientific revolution uh, was by making knowledge more rigid. Uh, where before, if some observation didn't match, you know, some claim, you can always kind of shrug and be like, "Well, I guess the person who transcribed that thing, you know, just like made a mistake or whatever." And so, by making things more rigid, it's easier to break them, uh, and you know, then you can notice discrepancies between, I guess, the the theory or the claim or whatever, and, and you know, the actual reality. And I think there's some version of that organizationally where I mean, not, I'm not drawing like that precise parallel, but there are you know, analogous dynamics where the, the nature of oral cultures and textual cultures um, are are just quite different uh, and um, you know so the, the 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 kinds of collaboration that are possible and the kinds of consistency that can be achieved like it is just fundamentally different and you know um, is it is it is the uh, um, is the you know, front or rear wheel of the bicycle more valuable. Um, I guess theoretically you can have unicycle, but like as a as a practical matter, you do just need both. Mm. Um, I said I know I said no more AI questions, but on this particular point, uh, it actually seems very legitimate to me that you you might expect uh, firms that have a lot of writing to be the 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 first to experience the productivity gains of AI because there's all this context that the model doesn't have available readily. I don't know if that's something you anticipate. I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. And if the model is really good, maybe you should be able to pick stuff up quickly. But um, I think most organizations are not recording all of their meetings um, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And if they're not, then yeah, there is this question of you know, what is the corpus? Uh, how do yeah. you get up to speed? So yeah, I, my guess is that'll be true. Uh, well, tell me about the internal LLM you built. Oh, um, it's uh, we didn't build an internal LLM. Uh, we uh, we built we built an internal. Um, LLM tool for making it very easy for people to integrate LLMs into um, into production services, um, uh, but also into uh, just into their regular workflows. You know, as as humans, uh, so um, the ability to you know, work directly, I guess, with the LLM you know, as, as a standard chat agent, you know, as lo lots of people have built, um, but then also to integrate that with some of our tools for you know querying and accessing data, um, or maybe most interestingly with sharing prompts uh, across um, you know, different people. Um, uh, and so you know, somebody might discover, I mean, one of my favorite examples actually is somebody put together a, a prompt for optimizing SQL queries. Um, and you know, it doesn't always work, <laughs> um, but, but sometimes it does. And like, it's very cheap to ask us, you know, got any ideas for optimizing the SQL query? Uh, and you know, sometimes it'll come up with, uh, with some good stuff. 
Um, and uh, and so yeah, the the, the collaborative abilities there uh, have have proven um, have proven surprisingly kind of high return. And then having just I mean, lots of organizations have this. We're not claiming that it's very novel or anything, but um, uh, having kind of a central bus to um, th through which to route all um, access to these LLMs, such that we can you know experiment with different models and have you know some degree of um, you know, observability into the respective performance trends, um, and and the I don't know, just the usage of different cases and so forth. Like that, we we have found building um, a fairly significant amount of production infrastructure around LLMs uh, to be valuable. And now, given the proliferation of LLMs themselves, uh, with you know all of the obvious contenders, this is proving quite valuable because we're able to try to figure out for different use cases which models, self-hosted models, who knows, uh, are, um, are are most effective. Uh, and you know, we I don't know what the total number of invocations is, but I'm I think we're making millions of invocations per day per day now. Like we, there are, there are just dozens of dozens of actual production use cases across Stripe and in all sorts of really. I mean, the, the financial services ecosystem is, is in some way um, a giant analog to digital uh, exercise because, like, humans are analog, mm. um, and intentions uh, and identities and all these things uh, have. Um, you know, th there's always some degree of kind of uh, uncertainty around them and some noise. Um, but then transactions are yeah. are digital, right? Uh, and we often find in these. Yeah, analog to digital conversions that LLMs can be a surprisingly interesting uh, augmenting tool. Mm. And actually, on that point about the, um, I don't know, the the, uh, the, the flexibility and the, uh, the the edge cases in the way humans interact with these systems. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in some sense, Stripe is uh, uh, like a really high stakes bug bounty program, right? If it, <laughs> if if somebody hacks it, uh, yeah, not not only the uh, your, your financial services, obviously, like money's uh, in play, but you know, uh, if there's like reliability issues, not just because of a hack, but because you deployed the wrong way, a significant percentage of of world GDP would grind to a halt, uh, at least while it's down. What, uh, I mean, how, how do you deal with that kind of responsibility? Like, how do you keep the uptime and uh, keep the reliability while deploying fast? Yeah, this is one of the things we've um, we've spent the most time on. And I mean, back to this point about <laughs> wanting to be the place with the best people. Um, if you, um, and you know, the, the, the value of focusing on craft so that you can have the best people, uh, in the context of software development, uh, one of the things that developers really hate uh, is, um, well, actually two things that developers hate, um, slow development cycles um, and, you know, it'll ship in the next release in a month and, you know, all th th that kind of thinking. Developers also hate being paged at 2 a.m. for incidents. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, given the criticality of, of, of the you know, businesses that we serve, um, uh, which, you know, is... In rough terms, one percent of the global economy. I mean, that's it's not totally clear how to measure this uh, because you know we're measuring a um, we're, we're not measuring uh, like GDP is defined as final goods, um, and Stripe is not only selling final goods, uh, and so like in theory there could be a bit of double counting, but Stripe is mostly selling final goods. Like we're not used for by and large um, for. Um, you know, giant supply chain shipments. Um, so I think, you know, maybe there's a mismeasurement of 10 or 20% or something, but but I, long, long story short, I think it works out to about 1% of global GDP. It's about a trillion dollars a year. And um, as you say, that that then makes us like really terrified of uh, of outages. And so we, we work so hard to enable fast uh, iteration and development cycles without having outages. And just to kind of put some numbers on it, um, <clears throat> we deploy production services that are in kind of the core charge flow um, around a thousand times a day. Um, uh, like most of these services are, are automatically deployed. So when anybody makes any production ready change, it just like goes into production and it's kind of meticulously and, uh, and carefully orchestrated so that it you know, first is uh, just run on some small sliver of traffic and then you know, incrementally more traffic until, until it's everything. Um, so about a thousand deploys per day um, uh, at Roughly, or, or you know, somewhat in excess of uh, five and a half nines, like ninety nine point nine 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 five percent reliability, which which works out to about um, I think about one hundred and yeah two two and a half minutes uh, of uh, of unavailability per year. Uh, it's not that we have obviously 
two and a half contiguous minutes of unavailability, but that's what I kind of uh, um, that, that's what it approximates. Um, even though it tends to happen, you know, as, as kind of background radiation throughout the year, um, and um, getting to that point, yeah, just takes a huge amount of investment in, uh, and, and then there's security properties that are right. less readily measured, but you know, analogous to uh, to, to to those figures, um, and <clears throat> I guess. Silicon Valley doesn't tend to. Maybe I'm, I'm perhaps being now unfair and kind of attributing things to Silicon Valley, but uh, maybe a, a lot of the tech industry doesn't place a lot of value on process and operational excellence. You know, we kind of culturally value the the spontaneous uh, and the creative and the iconoclastic um, and the uh, path breaking, uh, but building mechanisms that can enable really reliable. Uh, um, uh, Enable the very the very reliable provision of important services at scale, and you know, uh, removing the uh, the um, yeah sources of variability that can you know really cause a bad day for a very large number of people. I don't think they uh, get quite as much cultural credit. Um, but yeah, we have found that I mean, we've um, adopted all sorts of you know. For example, we found that uh, you know this, this kind of a a core feedback loop uh, around, you know, it, it isn't, none of this sounds like rocket science, but, you know, defining uh, what it is that we care about and then like building automated measuring systems to obviously measure to what degree it's actually happening in practice. Um, and then to sort of try to figure out, well, in the cases where we're not living up to that, like, what is the reason? Uh, and then to, you know, to actually intervene and to improve the system so that it, you know, that's not happening. And then importantly, to build kind of secondary controls that detect you know, instances of deviation long before they actually cause like a production problem or anything, but just, you know, where we understand the behavior of the system in sufficient detail that, you know, we can instrument it in, in some upstream way. Most of what I said there, I, I think was well understood by production engineers in, you know, 1930s. So again, I'm, I'm not claiming that it's any kind of radical breakthrough, but we have found that the adoption of these practices in like really kind of tenacious, like multi-year form um, is, um, yeah, just yields really high returns. Uh, and th th there may be other organizations that like both ship um, at that rate um, and kind of maintain that sort of developer velocity um, at this kind of combination of scale and reliability uh, and security. Um, but I don't think there are that many. Um, and I think it's a real testament to, um, yeah, the 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 remarkable folks at Stripe who made it happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, last day I point, but like actually the the fact that you have this um, hu huge internal tooling and testing mm. is like once you get the AI engineers, they can just like push the commits and you have the infrastructure set up that the, it can be uh, readily evaluated, you know? Yeah. Um, Across the board, I think so much comes back to um, what, what has to be true for us um, for us actually to be able to build um, and to kind of take seriously this goal of building, uh, you know, the best software. Uh, and you know, it's easy to say that as some you know lofty, vague, you know, hand wavy um, aspirational statement. But if you sort of take that seriously as a goal, um, uh, and if you think of well, what would you have to measure if if you know you were actually going to um, you know pursue it in earnest? Yeah. And what are the characteristics of organizations that do produce it? I mean, you, you get down to well, you know, customers have to really like your stuff, and so okay, well, how can we how can we measure that, and how can we systematize the process of making sure that there aren't regressions there? And so we have this concept of experience journeys, which are sort of pathways through Stripe that we really care are always implemented you know, at a really um, high quality level, uh, and it has to be true that developers can iterate very quickly. And you know, we just kind of spoke about how to make that happen. You know, and and and. Uh, and so I feel like, I mean, maybe a, a kind of a theme through through everything we've talked about is um, <laughs> actually taking the goal seriously. And I feel like a lot of what we do at Stripe is again, I I, I disclaim any um, any sort of genius in it. I, th I think it's just the the very earnest, repeated, serious, and long term application of. Of, of taking the goal seriously. Mm. A, a few more Stripe questions. Um, uh, you, one percent of GDP, uh, global GDP is like it's such a st staggering number. Uh, wh when you think about where further growth for, uh, for Stripe comes from, does it come from the internet economy expanding, or does it come from Stripe becoming a larger share of the internet economy? And to the extent that Stripe is growing faster than the internet, if like we consider that the beta in your case, where is that alpha coming for, from? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, 
I, um, well, the, the, the customers that Stripe serves um, uh, are outgrowing the internet, uh, the internet economy as a whole, like um, uh, in aggregate. Um, now, at some point, those have to converge for kind of obvious mathematical reasons. But, but you know, we're, we're 14 years in and they haven't converged yet. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's a lot of headroom there. And, you know, say Stripe is handing around a trillion dollars a year. Um, when Stripe started out, the global economy was 60 to 70 trillion-ish. Uh, the global economy is now around 100 trillion. And so, you know, we still have quite a bit of headroom before the, like, you know, the, the, um, the amount of activity that is coming out to Stripe is like really yeah. uh, butting up against the ceiling of, uh, of global economic growth. And of course, there's not like, there's no ceiling on global economic yeah. growth and, you know, for all sorts of, uh, of reasons, you know, it, it, it could be vastly higher than it is. And I don't even mean uh, new technologies or AIs or whatever, but just you know, obviously all the kind of basic per capita math you can do around, you know, what if everybody had a, you know, a, an income on par with the US? And, you know, I, I think it is. And rem like one of the reasons I... I I'm so interested in working on Stripe is I think it's, uh, you know, it's the um, the the old line, the the Lucas line about how when you start thinking about differential rates of development in countries, like it, it's hard to think about anything else. You know, why does Brazil have the particular income and GDP level that it does? Why does Poland have the level that it does? Why does why did Ireland have the trajectory that it did, where we went from being the kind of the sick man of Europe to uh, to now one of the wealthiest countries there? And I feel like Stripe is some applied version of this question in practice where you're, you're kind of building software products, but in some sense connected to or uh, you know, touching upon these questions of, well, why aren't there more countries? Excuse me, why aren't there more countries? Uh, why, why aren't there more companies? Um, yeah. And what determines the growth rate of a company? Um, like why, uh, you know, when, um, when you start the merch store, like why, why does it have, you know, X level of buyers uh, rather than, you know, 2X? Uh, and I, I, I actually think those questions, um, you know, I, I think those remain fruitful questions. We actually haven't optimized the meta system of business um, to any particularly great extent. For the vast majority of business, businesses have been offline, inefficient, um, you know, analog, everything. Uh, and it's really only over the last, you know, two, one to two decades that a significant share of this has been meaningfully digitized. Um, and the prospects for efficiency gains and optimizations there are still pretty significantly underexplored. And we find incredibly basic things like just, um, you know, just extending capital to businesses. Right. <laughs> As, I mean, uh, the reason we do that is not to generate profit from the loans, but because we find that the businesses whom we extend the capital then just grow faster on a on a sort of persistent, um, subsequent basis. Um, or, you know, trying to figure out how how does a business decide which countries uh, it sells in? Um, and you'll find even from the smallest business through to some of the largest businesses in the world that these are very kind of ad hoc and. Um, not particularly deeply thought through questions like, you know, why don't you sell in Mexico or in Brazil or whatever? It's like, well, it seemed kind of complicated and so we didn't quite get around to it and so forth. And, and so I think there's, um, to, 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 your, to your question about like, you know, where, where does the growth come from? I think that there's still an awful lot of low hanging fruit in just asking some of these incredibly basic questions. Mm. So uh, w w when we think about the, the way uh, in which Stripe will continue to grow in the future, in some sense, it'll obviously involve a lot of big businesses. And, you know, you're now processing a significant amount of Amazon volume. There's these other businesses you're doing deals with. Um, first, uh, tell me how uh, you think it, it kind of makes sense how an exponentially growing startup would contribute to exponentially growing growth for Stripe. How uh, does like the Stripe keep growing at the same trajectory when uh, this is existing big businesses that you're partnering with? And just second, like also like the case for why these startups matter is like so compelling, right? Like a new thing is coming into this world then we should really support it and make sure it happens. Um, why is it compelling that like Amazon can fulfill orders uh, more efficiently or something? Yeah, um, those, are, um, those are very good questions. So, um, so uh, on the first one, you're right. It's, uh, it's you know, Stripe is... <laughs> Stripe is doomed to eventually uh, grow at uh, uh, at the rate of the economy, uh, and uh, <laughs> there is just a question of you know how long it takes to right, get there. Right. right now, the good news is I think it can be a very long time uh, because uh, there's 
uh, as we just discussed, there is so much low hanging fruit uh, around um, you know, different optimizations and improvements uh, that are that are possible. Uh, and so I, you know, I think it could be many decades before that happens, um, but it's true um, uh, that will that will eventually occur. Um, on the on the second question about yeah, what's the like? Um, it's it's obviously virtuous or compelling or exciting to, to to foster all these nascent startups and to kind of be an anti-incumbency force. But what's the what's the case for for uh, supporting established businesses? I, I think people misunderstand where um, a small business, typically, not in every case, but but at least in the cases where we denote them startups, there's usually an embedded innovation and. The innovation is kind of all that the company is. Uh, like they have a new idea, and they're going to do something better or different, or you know whatever. Uh, and so, you know, generally speaking, we like innovation, and so we have you know positive sentiments towards that startup. Um, but there's a lot of innovation that comes from large established mm. businesses. That's not all they do. You know, there's also just running the existing thing. Um, and so maybe it's a, a smaller share, but but the aggregate fraction of innovation that comes from established businesses uh, is is really large. Uh, and you know, we have to be cognizant of the, I know, the, the cognitive bias of the uh, of of the startups perhaps being somewhat more conspicuous and maybe on a relative basis the improvements in turbine technology uh, or in fab technology or in insulation technology um, that uh, that come from established businesses. Um, there are, or well, to cho choose any sector of the economy, and a significant fraction of the important in, you know, inventions that occurred over the last you know, ten or twenty years will have come from fr from the incumbents. Uh, and so, um, I think as a as a general class, and you know, Tyler, of course, wrote a book on this. I think big business is underrated, right. uh, and uh, you know, if you look at the the survey data. Uh, people tend to have very positive sentiments, not only towards startups but towards small business as a class. Uh, whereas, if you, even though they've negative sentiments uh, or relatively negative sentiments towards big business, not that bad on an absolute basis, but uh, not as favorable. Uh, I think it's true that uh, that established businesses tend to pay better. They tend to be more efficient. More of the innovation in our economy comes from them, uh, and uh, and they produce a lot of consumer surplus. Yeah. Um, I think the specific case for Stripe working with them is. Typically, they're coming to us not because they want to, you know, take the thing that they're already doing and just, you know, go to all the um, the work of transposing it to Stripe, but because either they want to do a new thing uh, that they're just not doing today, and so it's associated with some new business line or some new in uh, innovation or invention or you know whatever, or they've spotted the, the opportunity to, um, I guess, to maybe not produce a new product. But to meaningfully change how they provide an existing one in a fashion that again yields consumer surplus, mm -hmm. and that sounds very you know abstract and theoretical. But in practice, what it tends to mean is they want to take this thing they're selling in this market and sell it in many more markets, or they've realized that they're selling it in this kind of modality and they should sell like, sell it in other more convenient ways, like they should they should sell it on mobile or something. And you know each of those, uh, if it's successful, if people actually buy it in any significant numbers. You know, I guess we're getting this decentralized signal from the economy that there's now something of value being provided uh, that wasn't uh, that wasn't here before. Uh, and of the you know, the, as I take stock of the businesses like the, the enterprises that um, uh, are in the process of migrating to Stripe or um, or that uh, did so over the last year, you know, whether it's the the large retailers or the large global manufacturing firms um, or shipping companies, things like this. It it typically has one of those one of those two patterns: new product or current product sold to people who weren't buying it before. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about just like the big trends in the society that are needed to solve our big problems, right? Like Moore's law or the cost of solar or something. These are just you have marginal improvements over many decades. That you yes. know the the. Um, you, big big tech or big companies are just able to invest a lot of money into doing the R and D. Relentless here. iterative improvement, yes, yeah. is, uh, is underrated. Can I ask about John for a second? Sure. Um, so uh, you you guys recently published uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac, and mm. subsequently uh, Charlie Munger has passed away. Um, uh, did you ever did Munger ever comment on your relationship, and if or whether it reminded him of uh, uh, his and Buffett's? Not to me, but he. He knew John better, mm. uh, and so it's it's possible that he did to John. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you learned about marriage from John? I mean, this <laughs> sort of like co-equal, uh, intense, lengthy partnership <laughs> is like the closest thing to that you have is marriage, right? 
Well, I, I'm relatively new to the practice of marriage, so <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I, it's maybe maybe in a decade I'll be able to kind of extract the generalizable commonalities. Um, um, I suppose the, the the general thing I'd say is uh, is I think working with people you're close to is underrated, mm. uh, and um, you know, I, I'm doing arc with. Um, with uh, Patrick Sue and and Silvana, uh, Fast Grands was with Tyler and uh, uh, and Silvana. Uh, uh, Stripe is obviously with uh, with with John, and actually John was also I, sh- I should mention instrumentally involved in Arc's formation. Like it, it would not have happened without John. Um, and and you know, could give more examples, but uh, but I feel like for all the I don't know, ventures of any significance in my life, they, they've like not only being with others, but being with other people that I'm very close to and where I had and would like to have an enduring relationship, uh, you know, that, that outlives them. And, you know, sometimes one hears the advice that, you know, you shouldn't work with friends or maybe you shouldn't work with your, your partner or something like that. And look, I, all these things are idiosyncratic and there are, um, there are instances of every possible, um, you know, permutation, but, um, but for me, it's been a really, yeah, rewarding experience, and yeah, I, th- I think John and I um, you know, can can work together for. You never know life, but but you know, I I think we'll probably work together for decades, and um, I um, for, for us, it's been a, a really, but but both an important source of just meaning and again fulfillment, but also I think there's a real complementarity, uh, and I think that Stripe would be a a less effective company, you know without either of us and I'm just being from like a bandwidth standpoint or something, but I think we both bring you know, different things to bear. Mm. Uh, Patrick, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Hey everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode. As always, the most helpful thing you can do is to share the podcast, send it to people you think might enjoy it, put it in Twitter, your group chats, etc. Just blitz the world. Appreciate you listening. I'll see you next time. Cheers.